Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. We've got a bit of a meaty topic in this video as I have been given the challenge to say how would I negotiate the UK rejoining the EU. So my thanks to RM for posing that challenge. That is a very interesting question and I know that is one that various people are interested in. Now this is a massive topic um, so by necessity, I'm not going to be able to cover it in particular detail. This could be very top level. So, but I'm going to apply my negotiation skills to assess how this would be done. I'm going to try and not go into too much detail, talk for too long, make this video, you know, too, too long and boring. Um, but it will take as long as it takes. You know, as an aside, um, these videos are not scripted. I put together the slide and I do them all in one take. And I do that deliberately to try and improve how I communicate about these things. So for anyone not familiar with this channel, I am the collaborative negotiator. I'm a professional negotiator of over 10 years of experience. And in this channel, I like to talk about various negotiation topics and strategies. And I have to say that it probably don't get any bigger than this one. This is a, a massive topic. And I'm sure many people will be interested in understanding some of the issues behind it. So let's give it a go. So before launching into this, there are some preconditions that we need to understand. So the first one is that this is not any immediate plan. No one should be under any illusion that the UK will be rejoining the EU anytime soon. Um, there are various reasons for this. But the fundamental one is, is that the current um, policy pursued by Brexiteers is very much a scorched earth policy. They are deliberately engineering it to make it as difficult as possible for any future government, any future political party to be able to take the UK back into the EU. Uh, they're doing that in the way that they're implementing Brexit and they're doing that in the way that they're anti antagonising the EU. So it'd be under no illusion that for anyone who wants to have a strategy of rejoining the EU, you need to play the long game. You need to have a multi-year strategy with a whole host of things, a whole host of phases, if you like, to, to go into it. And I will cover that in this video, at least some of it. So the UK will also have to understand the political as well as technical challenges. So you can't rejoin the EU without political legitimacy. Uh, and that political legitimacy has to come from the UK electorate. And right now, um, you c even though the majority may swing to a small majority, wanting to, that wishing they hadn't left the EU, that is not big enough to say that there's a political mandate to rejoin the EU. So that's um, one thing we also have to understand. The other is that the EU itself and the member states may not want the UK to rejoin for a variety of reasons. And again, I will cover some of that as we go along. Another thing, another precondition, is that there has to be new political leadership. Um, this cannot be done by the Conservative Party. There is no prospect whatsoever, regardless of whether Johnson remains as Prime Minister or not. No uh, future Prime Minister, Conservative one, will attempt to rejoin the EU um, within the next 10 years at minimum. So, uh, so even though this may not be on the guard for at least 10 years or 10, 20 years anyway, uh, and a fundamental precursor is that it will have to be a non-Conservative party. You can make an argument it might not even be a Labour Party either. It may have to be something completely new, a party that currently does not exist. Um, you, you may make that case that, that is what is required. But the precursor is new political leadership willing to take, put the hard graft in towards rejoining. rejoining. Uh, be under no illusion, that is what's required. And the final point I want to make here, that negotiations don't start at the negotiation table. Negotiations start well before. So for anyone who wants to adopt a rejoin the EU strategy, their negotiation strategy planning has to start pretty much now. Now, just as a slight warning, 
um, as a negotiator myself, I am not a normal negotiator. I have a very unique style, a very different way of doing things. That has been extremely successful for me, and it's a part of why I'm trying to teach these uh, taste tactics and techniques. So buckle up, because this is going to be interesting. So, those who are familiar with this channel will know from previous videos that I have taught that there's some fundamental questions you should always ask yourself before launching to any kind of negotiation. No doubt they will take me to task if I don't follow my own advice. So here we go, we'll go with the first question. And the first question that I always ask anyone who's beginning a negotiation is what are the objectives that you're trying to achieve? What is the outcome? And don't say to negotiate something or to reach an agreement. That is not a valid objective or an outcome. You are negotiating or reaching an agreement on something for something else. So whatever that end state looks like. So the question here is, what is that end state? Why does the UK actually want to rejoin the EU? What does it want from that relationship? I know what most people would say, of course, which is a return to the status quo what the UK had before the nightmare Brexit began and pretty much destroyed the UK economy and political fabric. To be brutally honest, I think a return to the status quo, desirable as it might seem to many, is perhaps an unrealistic objective. We have to remember that the EU has evolved over many years and that new nations joining the EU will not be able to join the same way that the UK did. So for example, they might be required to have the Euro. They might be required to have very close political alignment with the other EU nations, you know, their political objectives, as well as their economic objectives. So, the, so one thing you can be sure of is that if the UK does rejoin the, the EU, um, and if it does so as a full member, rather than a sort of a, a member light, Norway style, then the UK is going to have to give some things up. Does that mean the pound as a, as a currency? I don't know, that is a question. But it will certainly mean that the UK will have to demonstrate closer political alignment to the EU. The UK will also not have the rebate. The UA, UK will pay full membership fees when rejoining. So we have to bear these things in mind. So basically it comes back to a question of what sort of membership does the UK want with it comes to, when it comes to rejoining the EU and how much is it willing to pay? You know this is not a straightforward answer and um, the UK can attempt to come back as a full member or the UK could perhaps decide that that is far too much and no doubt in the in the shorter term, it would decide that that's too much and try and rejoin the single market and the customs union as a first step and maybe even as a final step. But the UK has to understand that so anyone seeking to rejoin the EU must be able to articulate what that membership status looks like. And this is one of the, one of the fundamental flaws of the whole Brexit campaign, which is why the UK is in the problems it is in now is that what the UK looks like outside of the EU was never made clear because the UK could have left the EU for membership but retained access to the single market. But though promoting a hard Brexit did not want that um, for various reasons, many of them delusional, but they did not want that. And as a consequence of that, uh, that particular failure, there is no political consensus of what good or a good Brexit looks like. Hence, we're still talking about Brexit, however many years on, we're five or six, I think now. So, the UK must understand what sort of membership it wants before any campaign to rejoin the EU. And that needs to be clearly articulated. You also need to understand what sort of UK would rejoin the EU because it will not be the same UK that left. And I'll cover more of that as we go through the video. Another one of the questions that I always encourage people to ask when they're starting the negotiation 
on the negotiation planning rather, is what do you know? Now, I'm not going to be at all comprehensive here. There could be a whole video in its own right and would bore you to tears. But here's a few headlines, if you like. Of what do we know about trying to rejoin the EU? We know there will be stiff resistance. That will come from the UK electorate, who will perhaps still desire Brexit. Perhaps they won't desire Brexit, but just don't want to go through the whole pain of rejoining the EU. You may also have resistance from the EU themselves. You may have resistance from those outside the EU who quite like the UK not being part of the EU for whatever reason. So you should be under no illusion that there will be resistance to any campaign to rejoin the EU. And some of that might even come from unlikely quarters. And I'm speculating here. But for example, you may even find that Scotland would want to rejoin the EU, but would not want England rejoining the EU and would not want Westminster pushing that campaign. So you may even find just say if you were promoting a rejoin the EU campaign, you may even find yourself being resisted by people who themselves want to rejoin the EU. That should not be discounted as a possibility. You should also, we also know that, that joining the EU is not a simple task. It's a very long process uh, that normally takes years. And here's slightly one of the ironies is that the longer it takes, and we know by necessity, it will take a long time for the UK to be in a position to want to rejoin the EU. But the longer it takes, the more divergence happens from the EU. So really, to minimise the pain, rejoining the EU quickly would be desirable. But politically, that is just not going to happen. So the longer it takes, the more painful, the more difficult it is to get back into the EU and the single market. And that also has to be borne in mind. You also have to understand that this whole U-turn in UK government policy will require some very unique political leadership. So think about many people in the UK will idolise Churchill as the wartime leader in World War II. He was a strong personality, an impatient, abrasive personality to be sure, but he was seen as the right person at that time to lead that country in leadership, in terms of leadership during a very difficult time in UK history. For this to happen, you need someone even better than Churchill. Less abrasive, that's for sure. Someone able to communicate, communicate a clear vision, a clear leadership style, and able to build consensus. And it doesn't matter how good an individual you have at the top as Prime Minister, they will need an unparalleled amount of political cooperation from all parties in the UK to make rejoining the EU happen. So that is something that also has to be borne in mind, and we do know. And finally, we know the UK will not be getting its rebate back. So it will cost the UK a lot more to rejoin the EU. Will it cost £350 million a week or even more than that? Who knows? But it certainly will not be the £161 million per week that it used to cost the UK. What don't we know? Now, I am being very short here because this would be a massive piece of work if I was to do this properly. But here's just some headlines, just to give you some thoughts or things to think about. First, of course, how much political support is there to rejoin? There's no point being a political party with the aspiration to rejoin the EU. You need a significant chunk of the electorate to support that objective. And I do mean significant. The uh, referendum mandate for Brexit was razor thin, down to 2%. That is not good enough. Um, and that was, again, one of the travesties of the whole referendum is that it was never acknowledged by those promoting Brexit that that wasn't good enough and they should have done more to amend that, to fix that, to bring people on board. They didn't. But the UK, as of today, still remains very much divided, almost 50-50. It can wave one way or another, depending on which poll you, you, know, you look at. But right now, there isn't that significant political support. 
may be in many years time there will be and whoever wishes to promote this rejoin strategy will need to understand that and know that and what is the roadmap as i said this would be a huge bit of work in itself what does the uk need to do to be able to rejoin the eu and that is not a question that can be answered at this time it can only be answered perhaps even fleetingly many years time but you have to understand that that is something you don't know which is essential to this project and therefore you need to have a strategy for developing that roadmap fleshing out in detail and resourcing a big team to tracking that roadmap so for those who are familiar with project planning project management principles basically you need project scheduling project planner um, to help manage the huge level and huge number of work strands that would need to go into this project and of course the final question but not to be honest <laughs> going to be the most important is what will it cost the uk what will be the actual figure and i don't mean just the cost in financial terms but i also mean the political cost because there will be a high political cost not just within the uk itself but also globally internationally around the world and to anyone pushing forward the strategy we need to identify what is that cost that will result so here's a few a very rough sketch of some of the stakeholders again i'm being very top level here and normally i go into far more detail but i don't want to do that in this video because that would just make it boring but again for anyone doing any kind of negotiation who are your key stakeholders have at least a list and a strategy for engaging each of them so a very sweeping category uk political establishment you need to get uk politics behind this plan so you need to manage them they are an essential stakeholder in that respect you also need to get the uk media behind it it is very much obvious at this point that the uk media is reluctant to abandon its brexit support and stance however we are seeing increasing increasing number of articles from uk media criticizing how badly brexit has been implemented so again in any leader wanting to rejoin the eu will need to get the uk media on board to support that objective because otherwise they will get nowhere and whatever anyone's views about the uk media that is essential you also of course need to get the eu commission to support the strategy and their member states and that's a, that's a no-brainer i've also added here the devolved administrations and i'll come on to that a little bit more in, in, in a bit but the devolved administration will definitely need to support this strategy and actually definitely need to be involved as part of the strategy and this is one of the huge failures um, both by Theresa May and then recklessly to a ridiculous degree by Boris Johnson is that they refused to engage the devolved administrations in any meaningful way and, and that is what has created the level of resentment and anger that exists there today and of course that is still evolving especially in Northern Ireland where things could potentially get very serious as a consequence of that failure to engage the devolved administrations so any strategy to rejoin the eu should not make that mistake you also need to think about international allies it could be the us it could be the france it could be germany it could be australia these are countries that the uk engages with on a whole host of matters and by pivoting back to the eu that will mean that those countries need to change their strategies and their relationships with the UK as a consequence. So they need to be engaged too. And finally, and certainly not least, the UK electorate. There is no point ramming through a rejoined strategy if you don't have the UK electorate behind you. And they need to not only be behind the leadership, but understanding what is going on, understanding the challenges, and making informed political decisions as a consequence so heading into the next bit the first thing i always teach people when actually starting your negotiations is that it starts internally before you go external and here it's absolutely no exception 
you've got to lay the groundwork before you can properly begin to negotiate any kind of deal. And when it comes to something as big and as complicated and as horrific as Brexit, then all that groundwork needs to happen within the UK before you even seriously talk to the EU. So the first thing, so this is of course assuming all the preconditions have been met, you've got the leadership, it's got a mandate and so on and so forth, and that they're able to do this. So those are the assumptions that we're operating. But so the first bit that any political leader would need to do is to stabilise the union. As I've already mentioned, um, there's a great deal of anger and resentment in the devolved uh, region for what has happened, particularly, particularly in Northern Ireland. And so there is a very real risk of the breakup of the union. And maybe that future will be that it would only be, for example, England and Wales trying to rejoin the, the EU. And if that's the case, then at least you have that union and you know where you stand. But what you don't want as a political leader is to be trying to do a rejoin strategy at the same time as countries or regions like Northern Ireland and Scotland are splitting off. Because that is hugely destabilising at a time when you probably don't have the capacity to cope with it. So that's got to be the first step, stabilise the union, to present a coherent viewpoint. And that's something I always preach in any negotiation. Everybody must be singing off the same hymn sheet. Everyone must be aligned and in agreement with the direction of travel. And that would be no, no exception here. The other thing that would need to happen is that the UK would actually need to unilaterally realign back with the EU. Now, this is one of the weird travesties of Brexit that they never wish to talk about, is that the UK outside of the EU can follow EU regulations and rules without the EU's consent. You don't need the EU's consent to follow their rules. And in fact, many countries around the world do exactly that. They've realised that the EU have done all the hard work in terms of creating standards and regulations, and then they just copy it and make whatever adaptions if required for their local uh, economy or, you know, or your country. And uh, the EU is very happy with countries doing that. Um, you know, as I say, the sincerest uh, form of flat, you know, flat, you know compliment is, uh, you know, to, to, to copy what, what they're doing. So the UK would need to do this. This is because of the issue of divergence. The more the UK diverges away from EU regulations and standards, the harder it is to, to go back in or to trade and so on. So the sooner you halt that divergence, the easier it is to, to come back and to rejoin. And here's another thing that also needs to happen. The UK will need to implement significant political reform. And the reason why I say that is because the UK democracy, as it currently stands, is broken. It was a very sort of barely democratic by modern standards, even before the whole Brexit thing kicks in. And one of the things you have to understand what the Conservatives have done is that they have fundamentally undermined and broken UK democracy. And the EU Commission and the EU Member States are very much aware of this. So they, they basically consider UK democratic processes to be barely one step above failed state. It's uh, that bad. So as a precondition for any rejoining, the UK will have to fix all its democratic problems. It will have to fix democratic legitimacy. It will have to fix the voting system. It will have to fix how the Parliament can properly hold the executive to account. All of these things are currently missing in the UK system. And in fact, the situation is currently getting worse because the Conservative government are systematically dismantling de democratic protections in the UK system whether that's used to do with the judiciary, the way Parliament work, the way devolved administrations work, just about across the board, the Conservative government, as of today, is reducing the UK democracy, is reducing protections. So that would have to be reversed as a precursor to any rejoining the EU. Does that mean the UK might have proportional representation and perhaps bring in the devolved administration in a federal style like Germany does? I don't know, that is one of many options. 
but whatever option is pursued, it needs to be at, the, at least beginning to be implemented before any discussions to rejoin the EU can start. And that is huge. That is a massive chunk of work that needs to be done. And I'm pretty sure the EU Commission will insist upon it. And this is one of the things for the EU Commission. They're very big on any new members having robust democratic processes. And right now, the UK is not seen as in that category. Another thing that I also say that any political leader would have to do as part of the rejoining negotiation strategy is delegitimise Brexit. And I will talk more about that in the next slide. But for now, I'm just going to jump to the next bit, which is how they would legitimise themselves. And the obvious way of doing that, of course, is you have a referendum. Now, a referendum is just a vote. It's just the means by which people go to the ballot box, put their X against the options, and then that option gets taken forward. So what I mean by legitimacy isn't just about a vote. It's about civic society. It's about a political discourse where people are able to have their say, to voice their concerns and their views, and even their objections to uh, rejoining the EU, if they so wish. Those objections are heard, and properly countered and argued against. So the whole process of legitimising any strategy to rejoin the EU is all about having that conversation and making people understand what are the issues at play, what are the benefits and costs of pursuing that particular strategy. This was not done by either side during the Brexit referendum campaign. And again, this is one of the major reasons why Brexit remains so toxic in the UK today. So again, anyone seeking to rejoin the EU should not make that mistake. Learn the lesson and make sure to establish full legitimacy in the vote. Because at the end of the day, if people think that the vote was not legitimate, because people were not well informed or didn't make good decisions, then it undermined the mandate to implement it. And that is one of the fundamental issues of Brexit. And having completed all these things, then I would argue this is when you begin your formal negotiation with the EU to rejoin. Now, I promised to talk about delegitimization, and this is perhaps a bit more controversial than people quite might be willing to think about. Brexit is toxic, and there's growing recognition in the UK electorate that Brexit has done a huge amount of harm to the UK, politically, internationally, economically. And I know there'll be people who might listen to this particular video and disagree with that, and that is fine. However, there is growing consensus around this viewpoint. However, that is not enough. So any political leader wanting to negotiate with the EU needs to really strengthen their hand. And what they need to do it really make it abundantly clear to the UK electorate just how bad Brexit has been, just how much it has cost the UK on so many levels. So call it propaganda, call it messaging, call it spin, call it whatever you want. But one of the first things that they will need to do is regularly promote the message of how harmful Brexit has been, what it has done, what is the cost. Um, what is the cost in jobs, what is the cost in trade and the economic impact, GDP figures, whatever it is. And of course, the human cost to people whose businesses have folded under businesses they've had for many years, they've been through the family for many generations. All of that has folded as a consequence of Brexit. All those stories need to be told. And that would be part of a deliberate strategy to really let the UK electorate understand so that when they do go to the referendum, they understand what it is they're voting for, or not voting for, as the case may be. So this does, of course, mean that there should also be regular comparison with other countries in the EU, and not just within the EU, outside the EU as well, perhaps. So those countries that aren't, aren't part of trading blocks, how well do they do? Uh, how well do French France or Germany or any other country in the EU, how do well they solve problems? And how does the EU help them solve problems? And how does that make them more efficient, more economically prosperous, more politically coherent, whatever it may be? 
what I'm pointing so what I'm pointing to here is that can't just be a negative news story all the time. There needs to be positives too. And so there needs to be a clear message of here are the benefits of EU membership that we gave up. And here be how we can see it working in practice for various countries. The next thing, and I call it improved education. Many people, and it was a charge in Brexit, people didn't know what they were voting for. And I know a lot of people who did vote for Brexit will take umbrage at that particular claim. But there was some truth behind that. People didn't understand fully the economic global trading impact that would result. And to be fair, that is not necessarily a direct Brexit situation. That is a, the result of the policies pursued by the Conservative government more so than Brexit, arguably. But either way, it is linked to Brexit. And to prevent recurrence of that, to prevent recurrence of the charge that they didn't know what they were voting for, there needs to be a really good information campaign, both for and against rejoining the EU, with all the economic data, or the political information, whatever it may be. That needs to be clearly out there and clearly debated, and people need to feel engaged with that process. There's no shortcuts here. Don't go assuming you can just implement a rejoined EU by telling people what they want to hear, um, like the, you know, Boris Johnson and the Brexit campaign did. They did that. That is why we're in this mess in the first place. So I say, any rejoining strategy needs to seek to help educate people to make informed decisions, whatever that decision may be. And finally, and this is going to be the absolutely most controversial part of the strategy. Um, I would say that to properly delegitimize Brexit, you need to prosecute the leading light of those who promoted Brexit. So take Boris Johnson as a classic example. Any political leader wishing to promote, you know, delegitimize Brexit should be actively pushing for people like Boris Johnson to be in court answering a whole host of charges, corruption, malfeasance in public office, um, electoral fraud, whatever it may be. Now, people will point out that this is political vindictiveness, and that is a justifiable thing to say. And I'm not coming at this to be spiteful to Johnson or the Conservative Party. Although I fully acknowledge that this can be seen in that context, it would be hugely politically destabilizing um, and it could actually, if, if successful, destroy the Conservative Party. But I'm coming at this twofold. One is that this is a strategy that is necessary for the negotiation. And I've touched upon this before in a previous video when it comes to trying to renege on the terrible trade agreements that were promoted by Boris Johnson and his crowd that uh, to, to renege on them, you need to break them. And the easiest way to break them is to have the message that the, the people pushing them forward were criminals, basically. So that's one part of the strategy. It would be easier to negotiate with the EU if you can point to them that those who promoted Brexit have all gone to jail for fraud, for corruption, for malfeasance, whatever it may be, and that everything they've done to sour the relationship was a result of their criminal act. And therefore you, the new political leader turning up, is undoing all that harm. And unfortunately that means having to renegotiate agreements. And people will understand that and be on board with it. So that actually strengthened the negotiation hand. That is one angle that I'm coming from on this. The other angle is that it makes it politically very difficult to support Brexit in the UK. If all of those who are seen as the leadership of Brexit are basically in jail for all the various charges. Now, I'm not talking doing political show trials or anything like that. I genuinely believe that if you go digging hard enough, you'll find plenty of criminality in what these various individuals have done. I genuinely believe that. Um, what I know is that there is a lack of political will to go ahead and do it. So my argument here is that any strategy to rejoin the EU should have this in mind as a serious option as part of the delegitimization strategy. 
because that will really accelerate people's understanding of how badly they've been lied to and betrayed by the current leadership. So what does negotiation with the EU, what, what would that mean? Well, we have, to, uh, we have to acknowledge this is going to take a very long time. A long time to even get to the point of being able to negotiate with the EU. And it will take a very long time to actually even negotiate the rejoining strategy. You're going to need a lot of reassuring. The EU in particular and the member states do not want a situation where the UK flips in and out of the EU all the time and seesaws and destabilizes the whole bloc. They want to know that if the UK is going to rejoin, it is serious and it will stay rejoined. And this is why I talk about political reform as being a necessary precursor. Because, rightly or wrongly, the EU will no doubt believe that if the UK had a PR electoral system, voting system, it will probably be better able to build more consensus to stay within the EU and not to have such drastic shifts in policy as is currently the case in the adversarial third party to post system. So that would form part of the reassurance strategy. And it also formed part of the structural changes within the UK. The UK will need to make huge changes, whether politically or economically, in terms of regulations, in terms of attitude and culture and how it approaches things. And that is no small task. And the whole process of rejoining and the whole process of securing political support to rejoin will expend an enormous amount of resource and expertise. It will need a massive amount of people, the whole of government, behind this project, supporting it to make it happen. And as a result, it will require an unparalleled amount of teamwork. And this is why I mentioned the devolved administrations as key stakeholders. You will need those political leaders, like Nicola Sturgeon, for example, to perhaps put aside their political differences and work towards the common good. You need to sell that message. They need to sell that message. And you need to be put into singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were. You also need to beg for forgiveness from allies. Because the UK will have already destabilised things enough just to get to this stage. You will be destabilising things again to get back into the EU. And that will take a lot of political goodwill to implement uh, outside the EU as well as inside. So my concluding remarks on this really big topic, and I'm conscious this is quite a long video, but hopefully not too boring for people. Brexit has changed everything. There is just no going back. Um, the amount of harm that has been caused is phenomenal. The amount of destabilisation, uh, the amount of just arbitrary changes, just for the sake of a scorched earth policy to make it hard to go back. And what it's done is opened Pandora's box and a whole host of very nasty things have fallen out, including just how weak and vulnerable UK democracy is right now. So all of that has to be fixed. And that is why any negotiation strategy to rejoin the EU will have to acknowledge that the UK has to fix itself before it can rejoin the EU. There is no way around that. We'll have to fix all the damage that had been done and rebuild better, to coin a horrible political phrase. The UK will have to do that. And there is no easy path here. Yeah. You know, this is a long, hard slog. It will take a long time. It will require a lot of consensus, a lot of support, and a lot of hard work from big people. And I have to be honest, I don't see anyone in the UK political landscape right now who is big enough to do this. And no individual can do it alone. That is absolutely for certain. But I don't yet see any standout individual that will show the leadership, the skills required to be able to implement this. And I'm hoping wrong. I hope that individual does turn up and does do this, but I don't see that right now. They need to appear from wherever it is they're hiding. And of course, the final point is the UK needs friends again. 
the UK has lost so much as a consequence of Brexit. It is absolutely terrifying. So the, part of the strategy we need to be to rebuild relationship, rebuild trust back in the UK. And there's no easy shortcut to that. So perhaps a long video there. Um, but my thanks again to RM for posing the challenge. This is a very interesting question. And, um, and I will emphasize that this is just one strategy promoted by me. I've not thought about it in huge depth. And of course, um, there would be a lot more detail that would be required. But I hope you found this illuminating in terms of helping to understand the scale of the challenge and what is required. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing what people's comments and any suggestions they may have in the box below.